Welcome to the number one podcast covering Michigan State basketball. The Final Four is not in the schedule. Join Rod and me, Eric, as we dive deep into the Spartans to get you prepared for every game. Subscribe today for in-depth recruiting updates and fantastic interviews with today's important college basketball personalities like Robbie Hummel. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I have listened to your guys' podcasts numerous times on drives throughout any Midwestern Big Ten city, so I, I am big fans of your guys' work. Jay Billis. And next time, hey, if anybody in Michigan wants a December tea time, call me. You wimps won't show up, but I'll I'll be there. I'll be there and play in the cold, and Izzo will be in front of the fire with hot chocolate. Coaches Thomas Kelly. Oh, no problem. Glad to be back, man. Glad to be back. Mike Garland. Just can't sit there and trade twos for threes. You can't do it. You're gonna lose. Coming down the stretch, you're gonna lose. And more. You won't find better coverage of Spartan Hoops than you will get here. For both the casual and hardcore fan, come along as we take you for a green and white ride. Hey everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod here continuing our march through the Big Ten. Today as we continue with the traditional Big Ten teams, it's the number 14 Iowa Hawkeyes. So the question is, can the children of the corn continue to stay competitive? Or is this finally the year we begin to see the Fran swoon? Uh, Before we start, a quick word of thanks to all who support the show through one-time donations and on a recurring basis. For only about a dollar a week, you can help us keep rolling here with every game, pre- and post-game analysis, recruiting updates, interviews, media figures and players, and so much more. We all provide that for free to Spartan fans. If you think this show is worth at least a buck, we'd appreciate you heading over to the support page at www.tffinots.com slash support, where you can find the necessary links to help support the show. And a reminder that each year, Rod will offer his prognostication for the final standings of the Big Ten standings of 1 through 18. This also means that you have the opportunity to beat Rod in our Beat Rod Challenge and see if you can do better at predicting than Rod. Uh, and actually, you have to win the contest, You're just not doing better than Rod, because otherwise everybody won last year. So uh, The winner gets $100 in free apparel from our sp- Great Spartan sponsor, Nudge Printing. Send along your entries to me at eric, E-R-I-C, at tiffnots.com. And 1 through 18, uh, the tiebreaker is how many points Michigan State scores against Michigan this year. And a quick quick reminder, they play twice. I'm sparing Rod the uh, Iowa gear today, so I'm just, I'm in my, I got some nice green and white shirt. So I'm I'm not burning your eyes this time, Rod, so that's probably nice for, although I know the listeners at home can't see, but. We're going, we're going without the Hawkeye gold. Uh, so after four straight NCAA tournament bids, Fran McCaffrey's program saw the streak end last year with the 1915 uh, NIT season. I think they won a game, maybe two in the NIT. I can't recall now. Just pay so little attention you know, once teams get the NIT. Uh, they finished 10-10 in the conference, which was kind of where everybody ended up from the 500 mark. Uh, they, were, they were not in the top five in efficiency. And offensively, uh, which usually doesn't matter, they're only 16th, which is actually pretty good. But for a team that plays defense as badly as they do, it caused a lot of problems, and that's why they their record was so poor this year. Uh, they were when, they were actually so bad; they were the third worst uh, from Fran McCaffrey during his tenure there. And uh, you know, I think right now it's probably fair to say there are some rumblings of what's going on with Fran, uh, whether he's whether he's looking to leave or whether he's people are interested in him leaving. Uh, but it looks like his team, the program has kind of gone sideways or kind of spin its wheels a little bit. His son, Patrick, who had a COVID year to play this year, has opted not to return, and he's going to be playing elsewhere. And so, and his, I guess his youngest son, who's in high school, uh, is apparently not even considering coming to Iowa. He's already committed to, he committed to Butler, uh, which is where his older brother is playing. It's where Patrick transferred to. Oh, okay. All right. So... I mean, that I think is uh, bodes po- poorly <laughs> for for Iowa, at least as the program goes in for Fran. So anyway, it's just kind of a weird year for them. And, uh, you know, this may be one of those, maybe this is a place where you see a coaching change next year, but I guess we can talk about last season first. It, it all kind of goes hand in hand. So Iowa, <laughs> yeah, you know, Fran McCaffrey, I want to give him, and I'm, I'm often critical on this podcast of, of him and of Iowa because I'm not a fan of a style that so flagrantly disregards the need to defend. And and that's just how it's been at Iowa. Um, all the emphasis is on offense. They just don't ever really seem to care particularly about defending. And that to me, aesthetically, as well as competitively and, and, in the end result 
puts a cap on how good you can be, certainly in the Big Ten. Right. And But that said, you have to step back and recognize where Iowa was and where Fran McCaffrey took them. Now, I'm old enough to have seen an ebb and flow <laughs> in Iowa basketball. So when I first started following uh, Big Ten basketball, Lou Olson was the coach there, and he took them to a Final Four. It was actually the program's last Final Four in 1970. Or, Sorry, 1980, um, which had also been Purdue's last Final Four until last March um, when they changed to that. Um, and then at Iowa was, even after he left, you know, George Raveling came in and they were a little disappointing, but the talent level was always very, very high. And then Tom Davis succeeded him. And Tom Davis had some very good teams for quite a stretch of time. Yep. So basically for the first, I don't know, close, let's say, you know, close to 20 years that I paid attention to Big Ten basketball, Iowa was generally, I would call them an upper middle class Big Ten program. They weren't on the level that Indiana was at. They probably weren't on as good a level as um, Illinois or Michigan, but they would be right after that. They were a strong program on a yeah. pretty much year-in, year-out basis. You started to see things fray a bit toward the end of Tom Davis's tenure there. Though. Um, all of a sudden, recruiting wasn't quite as good. The translation of the talent that he did have to wins and losses wasn't quite as strong. And you started to see some slippage. And then they bring in Steve Alford, who was supposed to be the Wonder Boy in Iowa. And that just never came to fruition and really kicked off what I would say was about a 15-year down period between Alford's tenure and then Todd Licklider following, well, let's say the end of Tom Davis's tenure, all of Alford's tenure, and all of Todd Licklider's tenure. And, and during Licklider's period, that's where it really got bad. That's where it really got. Yeah. And so Fran was brought in to rebuild this, you know, once pretty good program from a, a, something of a low point. And it took him a while to get to get some traction, but eventually he did. And, you know, given where Iowa had been before he got there, to say that they've made four straight tournaments, that's achieving something. And so I have to give him his due. He's made that into a competitive program, into a place where I think the the measuring stick starts at making the NCAA tournament. You know, like that had come to be a fair expectation of Iowa basketball under Fran McCaffrey. So I think that's why last year was a, a disappointment uh, that he wasn't able to do that. They got to the NIT instead. You mentioned they went 10 and 10 in the league, but honestly, if you weren't Purdue or Michigan, pretty much everybody else was in the nine and eleven to eleven and nine <laughs> band. So that ten and ten just pretty means much, yeah. they were competitive. It doesn't mean much more, much more than that. Um, you mentioned the problem. The problem was twofold. It was not just a typical Fran defense. It was a really bad, third worst he's had. And believe me, that is saying something. Because even his good defenses have not been good. <laughs> this was truly awful. And so combining that with the fact that they were only a very good offense and not a great one, which, you know, four straight years of top five offensive efficiency, last year they're only 16. Most schools would kill to be 16. But with his program, if they're not better than that, given the defense they play, they're going to struggle some. You know, it's just that simple. And that's and that's what ended up happening. There actually were some what I thought were credible, surprising, but credible rumblings after the season ended that Fran might actually be looking to go. Um and that didn't end up coming to pass. Uh he's still in Iowa City. We just discussed briefly. His son, who was already on the team, and his younger son, who's going to start playing college basketball in the twenty-five fall of 25, um, both of them are playing at Butler or going to be playing at Butler. So apparently he's decided that enough's enough with 
And I, I have to believe some of that is just due to the stress of having a child play. And I think his younger son, Jack, who's still in high school, I believe you might know more about that than I do. I believe there was some, there was a car accident problem. There was some kind of issue. He killed, he, um, he was driving his car and struck and killed a pedestrian. And, um, so I, you know, I don't know that whether how much he was at fault whether manslaughter case you know i so or 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 he's not in prison yes right and that's all it's all resolved um but yeah i think that was part of the reason for leaving as well as what else is going you know all the other stuff going on for sure you you do have to wonder though i mean from fran's perspective he's been there i mean i have to go back and look how many years it's been it's been a long tenure there it's definitely in double digits in terms of the years. Oh, easily. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's been around a long time at Iowa. And I'm going to guess it's probably closing in on 15 years, right? It's got to be. Probably so, um, yeah. So you can understand, and he's not a young guy at this point, so you can understand where maybe he would say, you know what, who needs it? Uh, from the Iowa perspective, though, I think it's very dangerous because on the one hand, I could see an administration looking at it and saying, hey, he's done a decent job of stabilizing things and getting us to be mostly competitive on an annual basis. But we're not ever a serious threat. I mean, there's one year in his entire tenure where Iowa was a team you maybe gave a decent chance to in terms of winning a Big Ten title. And that was the COVID year. And in the end, they didn't really come that close. To winning it, you know? No. So uh, they're never really in position to do that. They're never a team that you look at and say, well, they could, again, absent what I thought were ridiculous expectations anyway, for a year or two in there where people thought they might be able to make a run in March. But if you can't guard anybody, you're going to struggle to win, you know, string together two, three wins in March. And that's how it's played out. So I could see the administration looking at that and saying, you know, maybe it's time to try to get somebody in who can get us to the next level. But there's a danger in that. I mean, and we've all seen examples of this over time. Minnesota football, when they fired Glenn Mason. Um, You know, Minnesota basketball, in my opinion, when they fired Tubby Smith. Those are two really good examples. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. It often does not work out the way you think it will when you're trying to level up. So I, you might know, you pay more attention to Iowa than I do. Um, I don't get the sense that there's really any strong feeling in the fan base to get rid of Fran. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I, so I don't think that's going to happen. I think it would be more likely that Fran would just kind of decide, you know what? I've, I've kind of had my fill. This is enough. And, and just decide to either retire outright or maybe go take a job somewhere else just to get a, a, a change of scenery. I agree. And I think, you know, your assessment of Iowa being sort of upper middle class is probably pretty accurate. If you look at them through the nineties and eighties, they were probably, uh, you know, equivalent to Michigan state. They'd tackle up and be really good for a year or so. And then they'd kind of just be, I'll be competitive, honest, right? Now, this comes with a caveat. Iowa cheated their asses off during those years. So it's all, I mean, that's well, a cat. Right. <laughs> so it's all, you know, you, you have Bruce to Pearl, view it. Yeah. yeah. Tom Davis cheated. Bruce Pearl was an assistant on him. Rattling was a known cheater. He was all tied up with Nike and yeah, all that stuff was going down. Lou Olson cheated before that. But, but that said, the on court stuff, I would actually rate Iowa. Over, if you're taking the entirety of say Judd's tenure, I would say Iowa was at the very least, a little more consistent. They didn't have the down years yeah. that Judd had. Now, they didn't have the upside that Judd's tenure had either. They didn't have a season. They didn't win a national title. Um, I don't know if they Judd won two Big Ten titles. Or three, I'm sorry. He no, won three, so won I don't 10. think they ever won any. But, but I would say Iowa was a little more consistent. Like, Iowa did not have years like you know the years between Skiles and Steve Smith or the years between um, Magic and Skiles they didn't have droughts like that so it was a yeah it was an upper middle class Big Ten program where I would say Michigan State would probably in that era be more fairly described as a middle class Big Ten 
overall. Yeah. Just with occasion better highs yes. and, and yeah. bigger lows. Yeah. Yep. More of a cyclical. Yeah. And I, I would say the my impression of the program right now in looking at it. So I was at Iowa uh, the end of the 90s and early 2000s, uh, which is the end of the Tom Davis era and the beginning of the Steve Alford era. And I've told the story many times of when Steve Alford came in, much ballyhooed. Uh-huh. Everyone's super excited about his hire. And it was the same year as Kirk Ferentz came in. And no one is right. excited about Kirk Ferentz. And of course, you know, now <laughs> history yeah. being what it is. Uh, but th- really what happened with Tom Davis, you know, obviously some recruiting problems, questions about other problems like, um, problems with alcohol. I mean, I don't know if that's actually the case, but I think, you know, um, that's really not uncommon in that profession, I suppose. But, uh, it, it was really just a problem with the fact that they just were unable to win the big 10. I mean, they were always, I mean, pretty consistently, they were like third or fourth, but they just never could sort of get over the, over the hump and they were getting the tournament pretty routinely yep. at that point. But again, you're not doing much damage to get the tournament. They're not winning the Big Ten. And I think the administration thinks we, if we just get a little bit more, like you said, just level up a tiny bit. And that's why they went yeah. for Steve Alford. Uh, and that, and they, you know, achieved a couple, they had a couple of good years with Alford. And then, you know, the whole thing just ex- imploded. And then Licklider, of course, is bad. But it, my feeling is that the program is kind of where it was then, where you have a program that, showed signs that it's so close, right? I mean, you had Garza and uh, you had a team that was contending for the Big Ten and theoretically could do a lot of damage in the NCAA tournament that, you know, from a ranks standpoint, looked like it was a very good contender, uh, but, you know, not able to get over the over the, um, over the the edge and get the Big Ten tournament wins or, you know, the Big Ten titles. And so they're just right at the right the precipice. Again, now they've kind of slid a little bit. This really, I mean, it feels like an identical <laughs> to Tom Davis where he just kind of started sliding a little bit at the end and then they just, and then they sort of decided mutually apart ways. It, it really feels the same with, with McCaffrey and the fact that his kids aren't going to be there uh, through some ex, you know, extenuating circumstances. Maybe it's hard playing for your dad yeah. and, you know, Patrick had the wrong, menta- I, you know, I don't know. Why well, hasn't, look, it's been rough if you look at it. So, the, I know his elder son seemed to get some fan abuse. You know, it was one of those, is there nepotism going on kind of stories, which unless, unless your kid yeah. is just unquestionably brilliant, you're going to, you're going to get. And then Patrick had both health issues and psychological issues. And then you got the youngest right. son who's got this, you know, yeah. He's got issues as well. I mean, <laughs> we'll just say that. Leave it that. It's, yeah. yeah, it has not been a smooth ride with his kids, to say the least. No, it's not. Yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely feel like we're nearing the end, and this might be it. Now, I would say the one thing you point out every year, it's the defense, and we've talked about it. Like, if he just found someone to help him. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he just... He's maybe he's he beyond have, help. He has, he has, but maybe he's just getting the wrong players. He has Whatever. not I don't done... Know what John Beeline was willing to do. That's I was very critical for a long time along very similar lines to John Beeline. And yep. you have to give credit, and I, I don't find that easy to do with anybody associated with Michigan, but you have to give credit to John Beeline in the latter stages, say the last four or five years of his tenure at Michigan, that he actually, because all of these guys have a have large egos. It just goes to the territory. You have to, right? But John Beeline yeah. found it within himself to bring a couple different people in. He brought one guy in for a year, Billy Donlin, who then left, and he replaced him with, um, brought a blank on his name, a guy that went to, uh, where'd he go? Illinois, Chicago? I think, but anyway, a, a couple of, yeah, um, I can't remember. a couple of defensive guys we're kind of given the keys to the defense. They have at it. And and it made a difference. Michigan all of a sudden became a very balanced, very well-rounded basketball team. And it made them better. You know, it, it tended to, I felt, it smoothed out the inconsistencies that he had had earlier in his Michigan tenure where he'd had some very, very good teams and then he'd have some teams that disappointed that kind of stop once, and and that's what tends to happen if you play both ends. For whatever reasons, Fran McCaffrey has been unwilling to do that, and I think it's definitely cost right. him. I mean, if you think about 
that team in the COVID year, which was his best team, that team had four guys, if if I, if memory serves, who got at least a cup of coffee in the NBA. Yeah. Because I believe Weisskamp has. I think he's played the NBA. I know Garza's played a little bit in the NBA, and then the two Murray brothers. That's a lot of talent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To have that kind yeah. of talent and not do more than they did, and then around those guys were a bunch of other good college players. Um, it, it it says something to me. It says that you can't keep playing this way and think that you're gonna you're gonna break through from being good to something beyond that. You know, I I can't imagine even play. You know, programs at, at any D one level, but especially when you're talking Big Ten. Those guys, and what no matter what they say about statistics and rate, if you know offensive defensive efficiency ratings, you know where you rank rebounding, etc. They know all those things, and so it's not like it's not like this would be any sort of surprise that he was that his defensive team teams defensively are really poor. I mean, he knows that, and he's chosen to not ever address it clearly because it's never been addressed. They continue to be bad. Michigan State has been bad rebounding the last couple of years. We talked about. I mean, not truly you know terrible terrible but pretty bad and they're you know you can tell there's an emphasis on it i mean it bothers yeah. you know the yeah. bothers the coach so i mean <laughs> they're addressing the problem most coaches will address those problems unless you think you can just overcome it with one end of your game i mean that that has to be what he's thought but i don't know there there are guys who have a philosophy and again it goes with ego where they they just simply believe eventually this is what I believe will work, will work. And it just, I, I just don't think in this case that that's solid, reflective of solid thinking. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, yeah. expecting different results. Right? Yeah, and, 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 and that's, and that's the thing, done. you know, you talk about Michigan State and rebounding. Well, that's, that's like, you know, that's like a three year deal, give or take. This yeah. is oh, yeah, right. mm-hmm. the entirety of his tenure. This has never changed. <laughs> right. this, yeah, you know, exactly. and John, that's what made John Beeline's case so remarkable to me is that had not been a problem just at Michigan. It had been a problem going back before that to West Virginia and before that and before that. So it had been his entire coaching tenure, much as it's the case with Grant, that he just didn't care about the defensive end. And, and yet he had the ability when push came to shove to look at it honestly and say all right i gotta change something here and to do it and swallow a little bit of ego in doing that that's pretty remarkable because most of the time in these kind of situations coaches don't do that and and that's the brand story that would be fascinating to because i don't think everyone's ever asked him that question i mean i don't i can't imagine i watch lots of john beeline interviews but to find out what it was that made him decide to do that because uh, you know, it's certainly at lower levels you can get o- you can get away with certain things, right? You can sure. be really bad at one end, but you can still overcome it. But at some point, when you get to the top level, you've got to be able an all around team, or at least you know you have some semblance of competency. I would both guess, ends. and I'm just guessing because you're, I've never heard him speak directly to it. Maybe he has, and I've missed it. But um, I would imagine he had been in the Michigan job for a while at that point. He'd probably been in it. I don't know, maybe eight years at the point he made that change, something like that. And I think he had probably had enough time to deduce, okay, in my best seasons, my can work. But it's not going to consistently put me there. If I want to consistently contend, I've got to get better at this end. And I'm not going to be able to do that myself. So I need to bring in somebody that can help. And I'm guessing that inconsistency is what did it. But yeah, it would be interesting to hear the actual answer. All right. Well, let's talk about the Iowa team. Uh, We'll always begin with the departing players brought to you by the Squeegee Squad of Grand Rapids. As Iowa cleans house a little bit, make sure your house is clean as well. You can, if you're in the Grand Rapids area, and that is a very large area, you can all the way out to Lansing even, uh, you can contact the Squeegee Squad of Grand Rapids, uh, 15% off of your window washing. They take care of your insides, the outsides, the screens, the windowsills. They can power wash your house, really whatever needs to be done. You can finally look out your windows and not be embarrassed. Uh, you can actually see all the kids out playing in the yards. So let that sunlight in. 
contact the Squeegee Squad at Grand Rapids. You can find ways to get SMIN contact uh, the team at the, our support page, the final force on the schedule.com slash support. I've had them come out. They're the nicest people. You will not regret it. They do fantastic work and they will get things clean for sure. So beginning with departing players of Ben Cricky, uh, who's obviously the big player uh, for the played the four, the five, well, mainly five. Uh, he was a transfer from Valpo. He averaged 13.8 points a game, 4.8 rebounds a game. Uh, and I mean, he's, a big you know veteran loss for the team so i mean that obviously he had a, he graduated so but anyway that's going to be a big one for them yeah and they you know they got better when they figured out that he and owen freeman could could play together yes um, i thought he was a he was a really good addition though it was another one of these you know very smart additions in the portal uh by mccaffrey mccaffrey has not in the portal era you know he hasn't hit the home run like you know the program defining kind of guy but he's managed to bring in, um, who's the kid? Rabracha. Right? Rabracha. I was going to say Rabracha was the one before him. He's, and he was great too from North Dakota yeah, or something. He's like that, managed yeah. to find these guys who are, again, not superstars, but very solid players. And Ricky was an example. Uh, so the next departing player is a little surprising. Tony Perkins, 6'4 guard, uh, averaging 14 points a game on 43, 30, and 79 shooting in very streaky shooter, uh, 4.6 assists a game to 1.9 turnovers a game, which is pretty typical for Iowa guards. Good assist turnover ratio. Uh, he's decided to take his final year at Missouri. Um, so I don't know. It's, I, I'm, I was not expecting that transfer, but there you got it. Yeah. And, and I think he was a, I look when, when it became obvious that he was going to be the guy they would, they would give first crack to the point position to, um, I was a little dubious about that, but you look at the numbers, he actually did a pretty good job. So yeah. I, I think, look, the, the big problem for Tony Perkins is that you could see the potential for him to be a really, really, really good offensive player, but it would have required finding a consistency with the jumper that he was never quite able yep. to locate. And I think that's what ultimately did him in and kept him from being a great player. Because he had, you know, good size for the position, good athlete. You know, he had a lot of tools to work with. Um, we'll see how it goes for him at Missouri with a, a you know, final year of play away from uh, from Iowa uh, to see if he finds a little more consistency with that. But I actually, I do think that's a loss. Oh yeah, he's a good. I mean, he's a good three level scorer. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of three-level scores, the next player, Patrick McCaffrey, who we talked about uh, earlier, 6'8 forward, averaged uh, almost nine points a game, 2.8 rebounds a game, started about half the games. He shot 44, 31, and 79. So, again, not great three-point shooter, okay, uh, but not enough that you could trust him. Uh, he'll be playing his next final year, as we mentioned earlier, at Butler. Yeah, you know, he had years at Iowa where he shot better than that and showed yeah. more potential. Uh, it just, we mentioned he had, he had physical health issues. He had mental health issues. It just never seemed to fully come together for him at Iowa. So I hope for his sake that, you know, his last year at Butler is a good one that he can just find some peace and, you know, just play freely, free of any kind of expectations free of familial pre related pressures, you know, all of that stuff and, and just go out and have fun. Uh, but it was clear that it was his best was probably not going to be reached at Iowa by this point. Yeah. He's never been as good as he was before he left with a mental. Right. Uh, that's issues. my, he came that's back. my, per yeah, he that's just my has, perception. Yeah. yeah. I think you're absolutely dead on there. Uh, finally, last player departing is DeSante Bowen. Uh, one of my wife's least favorite players in the team, six foot two point guard from Boston area. Uh, he averaged 4.4 .4 points a game on 40, 22 and 85 shooting uh, just a two, a two to 0 0.6 turnover assist turnover ratio. Uh, he just never really turned out to do much. It's actually shocking. His turnover ratio is that low because my wife was sure that he was always going to turn the ball over every time he had, <laughs> he had all the balls. You, could. you know, it's, it's been tough for Fran. I think Perkins was kind of an exception to this, but, You've seen Fran at different points try to find a more athletic option at the point, and it just never seems to happen. You know, when you think about 
who were the guys that that really tended to um, play that position at Iowa? It tended to be the less explosively athletic guys. Um, you know, Bohannon. Like yeah. he's he's a prime example, but he's not the only one. They've had other guys who fit that same mold all the time. And and Bowen is one of these guys, and again, there have been others where it felt to me like Fran was trying to get a different kind of player to maybe emerge at that position, but those types just never seemed to find themselves. And so Bowen transferred to St. Bonaventure, so he's going down you know, to the A-10 level, not a huge drop-off, but at least half a level. Um, probably the right move since he didn't exactly light it up in Iowa, and it's also getting back to his uh, native part of the country. Yeah, he, um, yeah, definitely with uh, Joe Toussaint and Connor McCaffrey. Yeah, tw- those are two players like that, a, you know. There you go. There's another not, example. Yeah, I mean, Joe Toussaint, athletic, but not someone who can actually you know, get the job done. Even, you know, going going back a little further, um, you know, he had sap Clemens from Lansing Sexton, who was not a super, super athletic guard, but a decently athletic one. And yet it was Mike Gessel that emerged as the guy at that position during that era. You know, yeah. it, it just feels to me like Rand's always tried to have that option, but that option never comes through for him. So he's he's instead stuck with the other kind of player. So then we talk about the returning players. And as you return back to your usual schedule, now that summer's coming to an end, I hate to say that now that we're in September, uh, head on over to nudge printing, nudge printing at nudgeprinting.com. Gabe and Brittany are fantastic Spartans. They have a great supply of Spartan apparel and they have introduced new hats. And these hats are not, you're like your typical hats where you just get stamped the Spartan logo or whatever. They're actually, um, specialized hats i've seen them and i'm by the time this episode drops it might already be on but you want to check it out if you have not a chance but they're super cool they've got like a spartan camo on the inside and then it's got the some vintage logo on the outside it's it's a really neat hat uh so you check those out uh, he's been working on them for months to get this perfected so uh you know they're not handcrafted but they are certainly um there's a lot of thought and uh, uh artistic creativity goes into producing these hats and really a lot of things on the, the list. There's so much stuff they've got on their, uh, on their, uh, so check out their stuff at nudgeprinting.com. You get 20% off. You type in nudge, or sorry, type in final four in the checkout code. Uh, so I'm wearing my stuff today and uh, you know, it's always my family's favorite stuff. So get nudge printing. Uh, so talking about returning players, we'll begin with Peyton Sanford, uh, six, seven senior. Uh, he's really emerged last season as a leader for the team and definitely their number one offensive option, averaging 16.4 points a game, 6.6 rebounds a game, 2.7 assists a game to just 1.3 turnovers. He shot 45, 38, and 91. And, um, I, you know, he's <laughs> he's the guy. Uh, he's option number one for Iowa. And, um, and he, at times, he can just be really, really lethal from the outside. Yeah, and, and he really seems to have found himself as – a primary option kind of player, you know, I, I, if I recall correctly, he had a pretty good freshman year shooting the ball. And then his sophomore season, he was in a terrible slump in the first half of the year. Yep. And, and then really started to find himself in the second half. And that just carried over all year last year. He was very, very effective. But to me, the 6.6 rebounds is impressive because yes, he's not a bruiser. He's not a guy that you look at and think, wow, that's a physical wing who really ought to be able to impact the game. And yet he he manages to do that. There's a lesson in there for maybe some of Michigan State's guys <laughs> at that position. Yeah. If Peyton Sanford can get 6.6 rebounds a game, Jaden Akins ought to be able to get five. For Even sure. though he's a little yeah. smaller, he's also much more athletic, and I'd wager he's stronger, you know? Um, yeah. But San, look, Sanford's become a really good player, and he's clearly the alpha on this team. Um, so he's a guy you got to worry about pretty much anywhere, anywhere you know, twenty five feet on in. You, you've got to be concerned about him. And I think the one thing that he really changed last last year is he really got 
he he developed his driving and ability to score inside mm-hmm. a lot more. He yep. was just outside shooter the first two years, and he's really made himself multidimensional. Uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of um, oh, I'm trying to think, not Boo Booey. I'm trying to think of someone else. I can't think of who it is now, but same thing last year. They kind of suddenly became a multi-level scorer, and it really makes it a lot harder to guard you. I mean, obviously, oh, I'm uh, Tomonaga, a guy who's you know, not yeah. just launching from deep, and he suddenly can hurt you other ways. And so you're like, oh, uh-huh. it makes it a lot harder to obviously defend. Uh, and the fact that he gets those many, that many rebounds, I, he's he may not be real big, but he's not afraid to get mixed up a little bit. And I, I do feel like at some times, I don't know if you want to say Michigan State players were sometimes a little soft, but they just try to avoid contact sometimes. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure they're worried about fouling. Anyway, he certainly was not afraid of that. And so he got rewarded a lot of times. And but I he, don't know, was he, often... plays, he plays with an edge. I mean, yeah, I, I, it... <laughs> as someone who doesn't watch them, you know, a ton, um, I've certainly noticed he, he plays with an edge, and that makes him more effective than you might think just looking at him in those grit areas of the game. Right. And so the offensive problem with Iowa, or at least the defensive issues that you're going to have face while playing against Iowa's offense, you may try and shut down Peyton Sanford, but you may get punished with Owen Freeman now, the 6'10", 230-pound uh, sophomore, who is um, – he strikes me as a guy who may develop into something a lot more than he was last year. Uh, he had foul trouble last year, but he still averaged 10.6 points a game and 6.6 rebounds a game, shot 66% from the floor, 66% from the line, and uh, certainly looks like a guy who can score a whole lot more. Uh, if he gets a few more minutes, his condition is a little bit better, and he's not uh, on the bench with foul issues. He really feels like a not like a Garza in the sense that he's going to be like a Garza player, but he's got the offensive, the footwork, I think, of a Garza but a little more athleticism, but certainly he feels like in that developmental stage, like where he's about ready to take a big jump. And I would not be surprised if he's a real load to take care of next year. Yeah. You know, he's a guy that Michigan state actually offered and recruited. So that was a a rare recruiting loss to Iowa. And he wasn't, it's interesting because um, by this stage, I think you'd have to acknowledge that Fran has a pretty good eye for big man talent. None of his, none of the bigs that he's had were top 50 guys. Garza wasn't coming out of high school. Right. Freeman certainly wasn't. And I think Tom Izzo has that, despite what some might think uh, <laughs> based on the position in recent <laughs> years. I think Tom Izzo historically has proven to be a guy who has a good eye for big man talent as well. And so it maybe shouldn't be a shocker that a guy both of those coaches wanted has turned out to be pretty good. But I, I will say, I don't think expectations were that Owen Freeman would do what he did as a freshman. No. 10.6 and 6.6 is pretty good. And he shot well. I haven't seen, you've seen a little more of him than I have. Did he show any kind of face-up game, like, you know, potential to stretch defenses? Yeah, yeah he does. I bet you, I bet you by his junior year, he'll be shooting threes. Okay. That's just my guess. Uh, assuming he saves the same system, et cetera, you know. So that may be yet to come. Um, I think so. And I, but yeah. I did see the, the post game. The post game is impressive and advanced. And he's got the size to to make good with that. You know, you put his size together with his, his post moves and you've got a pretty good combination. Um, I'm with you. I mean, if you would tell me right now that he's going to go from 10.6 to... 16.6 points a game, I wouldn't bat an eye. And, and could be a double-double guy, you know, with an improvement in rebounding. Uh, I think I think it's safe to assume that he's probably set to be a very productive player at I. And, you know, they just, they seem to have a knack for this. There hasn't really been a year since, gosh, it, it would be before Garza got there was the last time that center was any kind of an issue. And that looks set to continue with Owen Freeman. I think that the, the one the one thing I would mention, sorry, is that no, I do think he benefited by pairing him with Cricky last year. And so they've got to address the four spot and make sure that they've got a productive player who actually functions well in combination with Freeman. Because that really helped him last season. And that may be an issue, but we'll find out, I guess, this year. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I would. The only thing, thing I add about Freeman is I do think he defensively could be good. I mean, if there was an emphasis, you know, I Ooh. think he could be. What much makes better. you say that? I he just can move really well. I think okay. he just can. I think he he moves. He's got good lateral movement. I think. So he and, didn't have he didn't have Garza's issues then. No, he moves much better okay. than Garza. Right. Uh, but you know, you have to get coached. You have to be in a system, I suppose. And yeah, so, it's not know, enough not much to have. It's, of him. it's nice to have the physical tools. That certainly helps. Right. But yeah, that's. That's not enough in and of itself, but yeah, it's, and that's something to watch. And I'll say he doesn't have like the athleticism of um, of you know, the Murray brothers, you know that. Sure, he's not gonna he's not gonna jump out of his uh, right out of his shoes or anything like that. Uh, then move on to Josh Dix, six six junior wing, averaged almost nine points a game as a sophomore. He shot fifty five, forty two, and eighty six. So he's kind of your typical uh, wing for for Iowa, and also serves as a turnstile on defense. Yeah, I, when I think of or find somebody who embodies Iowa basketball under Fran McCaffrey, Josh <laughs> Dick's a pretty good example of that, right? Like the the physical appearance, the the skill set, the strengths, the weaknesses, they all line up. And, I, and I'm not mocking him. I mean, obviously, if you're a 42% three-point shooter as a 6'6 wing, you can help. But there are the defensive issues that come with it. And we'll just have to see if how much they can get out of him positively to offset the negative. Then the uh, point guard who I think will probably be the starting point guard, but I'm not sure. But Brock Harding, six foot sophomore, averaged 2.4 points a game on 36, 38, and 77 shooting, had a three to one assist to turnover ratio, played about 13 minutes. Uh, He's a player I really like. I think he's got, he does have actually a little bit of that, that athleticism. He has that fire, which well, maybe they'd have been had in a while. Um, you know, shooting is kind of streaky, but he, he could be a, he could really emerge this year as well for Iowa. Well, he's got, you know, the combination of shooting and the, the stereotypically strong sister turnover ratio in his back pocket. I don't know that I believe he'll start though. They've, they brought in a portal guy that we'll talk about who I think is going to have right. something to say about that. But, you know, he played 13 minutes a game. I do think it's realistic to expect that he'll see more minutes than that, even if he's not starting. Fran has a big line bench. Sure, play, because so he likes to play fast. So he typically yeah. goes a little deeper than some. Yeah. So not to be confused with Peyton is Price Sanford, the younger brother of uh, Peyton. He averaged 2.3 points a game. He's a 6'6 wing, shot 36, 35, and 67. Obviously, he didn't have a huge volume in that with those numbers. There are a couple of games where he just didn't play. Uh, it, cer- it certainly is a freshman, not nearly the impact that his older brother Peyton had. Uh, and I don't know if that's just because of the role, although I feel like he had plenty of ample opportunities in a team that had struggled sometimes a little bit offensively compared to when Peyton was a freshman. But either way, I mean, there's every reason to think that he'll he'll kind of round into shape, but we'll have to see. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is he was more highly regarded than Peyton. Yeah. And so I, I had expectations that he was going to come in and be productive for them as a true freshman, and it, it didn't really happen. Uh, the shooting numbers are not bad, but as you say, the volume was low. He just didn't get as much in the way of opportunity. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him start to find himself the way his older brother did. Um, because obviously there's some raw talent here. Um, so he's a name to watch because uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him emerge as a much steadier guy in terms of his role in the rotation. As, as he continues to mature. Lodge Jimbele is next. He's 6'8", 250-pound sophomore. He averaged 2.2 points a game and two rebounds a game. Uh, played every game, but not much. Uh, very big, obviously, physically. He sh- uh, he was shooting 38, 31, and 36, <laughs> 36% from the line. Uh, so he's definitely a, the body at the four they could put in. Uh, and he did show, strangely, some outside shooting proficiency considering he was so bad at the free throw line. Yeah, uh, you know, it seems to me like there's an opportunity for maybe one guy to emerge as a primary backup at the five, and Dembele would be the guy who played the biggest role of these three options, so I guess you'd have to label him uh, the prohibitive favorite. Uh, But I think they're going to probably be more likely to solve their four spot 
with newcomers, either freshmen yeah. or portal guys. We'll talk about in a minute. But Dembele, I think there's still a role for again one of these next three guys, and he'd be he'd be the favorite at the moment, in my opinion. Yeah, I and I also feel like Dembele, if I recall correctly, was starting to hit outside a lot more later in the season because we were shocked that he's shooting and like, oh, he's making yeah. a pretty decent level. So, you know, maybe that's something that's going to see more of this year. Uh, Evan Browns is a bronze is a six, nine, 240 pound fifth year player transferred in from Belmont last year. Uh, he is from Iowa city. Originally he averaged 0. 0.6 points a game and 0. 0.9 rebounds a game. Uh, so I guess he's, you know, back up at the five. Yeah. And he only got an 18 contest. So it can be another name for that backup five spot, but, you know, if we're judging on the body of work to date, we wouldn't make him the favorite. No. Nope. And finally, Riley, Riley Mulvey, he's a 6'11", 245 pound center. He was hurt last year, got redshirted, and uh, didn't play a whole lot in his previous time at Iowa, but he actually showed, he showed me that he's got some ability to, to mix it up and be effective in there. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little bit bigger role for him this season. Well, and he's the biggest of these guys, you know, 6'11", 245. Yeah. So if that's a factor, you know, he might have a little bit of an edge there. But again, when you're you're trying to figure who's likely to, to win that role, um, his track record doesn't suggest that he's the favorite. You never know about development, particularly among big men. And then we'll talk about the newcomers to the team. I will begin with Drew Thelwell. He's a 6'3 point guard. He's a fifth-year transfer from Moorhead State, averaged 10 points a game on 44, 34, and 65 shooting with a 6.2 to 2.3 assist to turnover ratio. Um, obviously, uh, if he can shoot a little better than 3 to 4, that'd be great, but he's got the assist to turnover ratio that Fran likes. There's no guarantee. I mean, I think that you're right. Harding is in that mix as well, but I would assume that that Thelwell is the, po- is the favorite to be the starter at the point, and there's things to like there. Those are Iowa-like numbers, you know, in terms of the way he plays the position. Yeah, they would like to see that deep shooting tick up a little bit. And you never know for sure about the translation from the Moorhead State level to the Big Ten. Um, But they needed to add, with Perkins leaving and, and Bowen, they needed to add somebody, I think, with experience at that spot. So whether he starts or not, he's going to play a lot. Next would be Seydoux Traore. 6'7", 210-pound transfer from Manhattan College. Uh, so he's a portal edition. <clears throat> he's a portal edition who brings in uh, 11.8 points a game and 8.2 rebounds a game as a freshman for the Jaspers. He shot 43, 26, and 80, also with 1.3 blocks a game. Well, I, I think he's the favorite to start at the four. Not huge. You know, 6'7", 210, but obviously teams have been able to succeed for quite a while now. By going smaller at four if you've got the right combination. I think more than pure size, the the really important thing is that he provides the right kind of combination with Freeman. And look, it's impressive. You know, yeah, he was doing it at Manhattan, but he was also a true freshman. So he's got three years of eligibility. And I take that in the kind of production that he had much more seriously considering he was a true freshman. The rebounding numbers, 8.2, that's a big deal because you would think that will at least to some degree translate. 1.3 blocks per game would be helpful, giving them a rim protection element. He's he's just obviously, he's an athletic guy who's able to be effective inside, and he's at least shown potential to get better on the perimeter to stretch defenses a bit, although obviously 26% from three, not a great number. But the fact that he shot 80% at the line suggests that there's more there to tap into, in my opinion. So I would make him the favorite right now to emerge as a starter at the power forward spot. Then we have Cooper Koch, uh, 6'9", 210-pound freshman, legacy Hawkeye. His dad, JR, played at Iowa in the 90s. Uh, so funny, i seen this because, so when I was a, a first-year med student at Iowa in the, in the late 90s, uh, or actually 96. So I actually uh, tutored for the men's and women's athletic department at Iowa. So I tutored a kid from the football team and I uh, dance team because the dance team members are part of the athletic department. And the, one of the girls, one of the girls I uh, tutored 
who actually is very smart. She needed much help from me. She was dating J.R. Kunch, so I wonder okay. if it if she's his mom. It'd be interesting. Yeah. Because <laughs> they were together. They were they were together for quite a while, so I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> let you go on. Um, and he's actually got I forget his brother's name. He's got a twin brother who's not as highly regarded, who I believe is non scholarship. Was also on the team this year, but he's a highly regarded prospect. Um Decent size. They'd obviously, I'm sure, feel like he needs to get stronger. But at 6'9", 210, they think he can play now. Uh, he's, a, as opposed to um, the uh, to Seydoux, um, this is a guy who they think can, can hit jumpers consistently. And his size also gives him a chance to be competitive on the glass. So I would, again, expect him to be in the mix for minutes, whether that means he's a starter is yet to be determined. I tend to think he, he's more likely to be a backup, but I also think he's going to play a fair amount. And finally, Chris Trot, uh, Tadho, he's a 6'8", 220-pound power forward freshman from Montreal, uh, and so he's a big physical rebounding presence. Yeah, and, and rebounding is something they're going to take. You know, you talk about Michigan State taking it seriously. You know, Iowa wasn't horrible last year, but they weren't where they'd been. If you go back the, the last few years prior to that, Iowa had actually, that had become part of of Fran's deal, is they had become a very consistently good rebounding program. They weren't quite at that level last year. So if they find that they're having issues again, this kid might get an opportunity to play some minutes. But I think he's more likely to be a developmental guy than the other players they brought in at that spot and so finally we're going to go to our player that other teams need to keep in the gutter brought to you by the brothers of just two gutters and i'm guessing you'll say probably peyton sanford is that correct yeah got gotta be at this point i think owen freeman could also emerge but for now you, you'd have to bet on peyton sand well if you're feeling life's in the gutter <clears throat> and you have problems with water in your house no better place to call than the brothers of just two gutters they can keep things clean and i know if there's one thing that Rod hates even more than going to the mailhouse is getting up on a ladder and cleaning out his gutters. So if you want to not do that anymore, they can put in gutter guards for you, uh, which I have in my house. And so it's so nice. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, you can also uh, have them just repair things, replace it, whatever you need to do, or just, you know, like I said, they can just clean it out for you too, if you need it. They can even do small jobs, big jobs. You just have one section gutter that's messing, messing up. Maybe it's just a downspout. Again, the brothers adjust your gutters can take care of you. They're all over the state, both the west side and the east side of the state, they can take care of you. So check out their uh, contact information at our support page at the final force on the schedule.com slash support. All right. So overall, I guess, you know, we kind of touched this a little bit early. This feels like a, maybe a inflection year for this program. Like if they, they almost have to move one direction or the other. Like I think if they stay kind of where they were, I feel like we're going to have maybe the end of Fran or he's just, you know, a mutual party ways. I'm I don't know what you think, but it just, it certainly feels like this is a year that with players that they just don't have what need they need. Um, you know, maybe they'll, they'll probably be competitive and they, they can still beat you and catch you if at the wrong, at the wrong night. But I don't know. They don't feel like they're going to, I don't think enough has changed to make them make me think that they're going to be anything special. You know, two straight years, I expected Iowa to decline a bit and two straight years, Different Murray brothers kept them afloat that I didn't see coming at the level that they were. Last year, they didn't have a Murray. So if it didn't happen, uh, I agree with you that you look at this team. I don't think it's impossible that they're improved. And I, I clearly they have talent. You know, Sanford, if the team wins enough, you could see him as an all Big Ten player. I think we both feel like Freeman is uh, on target to become a very, very good Big Ten five-man. So there are pieces there. You know, the question to me is around newcomers to some extent. Do they do they figure it out at the point? Because that's obviously a very important position for Iowa. They're used to having high-level point guard play at least in terms of orchestrating the offense. And do they have enough at the floor to handle things? Um, so I don't rule out that they could be better. But 
I think if you're weighing the odds, it doesn't feel to me like it would be a good bet uh, on this team to return to the tournament. I just think, you know, the Big Ten this year, we've talked a lot. We'll continue to talk about the fact that it, it looks incredibly wide open to me and extremely difficult to sort these teams. But I would say that when I look at it as objectively as I can, it doesn't seem to me that Iowa's odds are particularly good relative to other Big Ten teams to be in a, you know, in an 18-team league, not that there's any hard and fast rule, but I figure you probably, you want to be in the top 10 to feel good about your tournament chances, right? If you're 10th in an 18-team league, that would be a, normally it would be, you'd get it. In a decent year for the conference, you would get slightly over 50% of your teams in into the tournament. Sure. So that's kind of the measure that I'm using. And when I look at Iowa relative to some other teams, I just don't see a lot of reason to think that they're likely to finish quite at that level. But again, not impossible. It really comes down to how these newcomers fare. Um but if it if those guys don't seamlessly transition, you know Iowa could struggle again. And what have we got them? Fourteenth, I think. Yep, fourteenth. You know, yeah, that's that's not that's not as bad as it looked last year to have that number attached to you, but it's not great. And that's that's kind of where I land. And then what all that has to to say about Fran McCaffrey's future and the program's future. I, I think remains to be seen. I, I would say that it feels, when I try to look at this from an outsider's perspective, and I try to project myself into being an Iowa fan, would I feel that there's any reason to believe that Fran McCaffrey at this stage is likely to suddenly develop a Final Four caliber team? Probably no. not, right? Probably not. And and if if that's kind of the cap on what you can be, then you do start to wonder, well, what's the point in all this? I mean, I, I take it back to when I think about the last several years of Judd Heathcote's tenure. You know, part of what gave that some excitement and I think I think kept people away from loudly asking you know for him to be done is that tom Izzo joined his staff and you saw an immediate impact when Izzo got elevated into a, a full-time assistant coaching role and could have an impact on the recruiting trail you started to see that change you know 1988 he had arguably other than you know the magic and jay vincent and mike berkovich class the best recruiting class of his tenure at a fairly late stage, you know, when it was good enough that I mean, he had a we had a McDonald's all American and a couple of guys who were nearly that in that class that added a lot of juice and that carried over. He continued to recruit better than he had previously in large part because of Tom Izzo. Iowa doesn't have anything like that, that I'm aware of to add, some excitement or some reason to think, well, maybe thing, maybe we can have a team that can break through. And I think when you're in that situation, you know, it, it's hard, it's hard to maintain excitement or interest or optimism. And it also, you, you tell me, I mean, does it feel like Iowa basketball has a lot of enthusiasm around it right now from its family? No, I mean, it's not as, hey. it's not as bad as look letter. And, and I was just going to mention yeah, but that, that but that's not, that's totally unacceptable. I mean, that's not even a standard to use the liquid. No, no, no. I'm just saying that. But it, I would say it does. It does not feel that different than Licklider's okay. years. Fair enough. I mean, as far as the level of, I mean, just watching the games on TV, uh, there's there's not the level of interest in these games. Yeah, and, there's and just look, not the engagement of the fans. There, I hate I hate Iowa's fan base. I think they're. I think they're ridiculous <laughs> hits. I've said that. That goes back to when I was an adult. I was barely a teenager, and I right, had that right. view. And I'll never change that. <laughs> but that said, I would acknowledge 
that's a passion, you know, like much like Nebraska's fans. There's yes. nothing else to do in Iowa. Nothing. That's the pro and, team. Right. So there's enthusiasm for Hawkeye sports. And if you're not tapping into it, then the problem is likely with you, you know, and not yes. the fans. So if there's not that excitement there, that does probably say something, you know. But but I don't know. Then I then I look at it and I think I don't sense anything from the outside at least that you know that McCaffrey is likely to be forced out. So that's why I, I revert back to if there's going to be a change, it would seem to me that it probably comes from him. Yeah, I I I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't know the current situation in the athletic department. I, I would not be surprised. I I will actually okay. fair enough. I, I will not be surprised if he this is his last year unless something changes, which I have no reason to think that it's going to be significantly different, you know, than in the past. Like unless okay. there's some trajectory change, I think, uh, you know, Iowa has patience, but not uh, not unlimited. And so the, again, like I said, it feels a lot like the Tom Davis, where just all of a sudden it sort of felt like it kind of dwindles, and then all of a sudden it's like it's time for him to leave, and they just well, decided okay. to get rid of him. But I, I that's totally I dependent said... on on the the athletic department. I mean, I don't know who the like AD is, and if this has been, you know four years or if they're brand new. I mean, I don't know that situation because that was part of the dynamic with Davis leaving. They had a relatively new AD, I think coming in Bob Bowlesby. Yeah. With, you know, and so they were he, so clean house and Hayden Fry was leaving. And so it was just sort of like a time to new transition for both athletic departments or athletic teams. You, you say that, but then, and I realize it's a different situation because this guy has at least gotten them, you know, to big 10 championship games and that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I look at Kirk Ferentz and I mean, that's, got to be in some ways a, a, a lot to try people's patience to have the kind of offenses that they've rolled out there for the last several years and yet there's no change right i mean he got rid of yeah. his son but that's you know and i understand he's achieved at a better level than mccaffrey has but you know when you say there's not unlimited patience i hear you but i then also wonder you know if this was iowa in 1998 I would say absolutely that there would be pressure from fans and that the administration would feel to say, well, we got to get somebody in who can, who can actually aspire to winning everything, you know, that, but it's been a long time since 1998. And it sure. Just, but I, I will also defend the Iowa football program in this manner only. They do win. Now, yes, they don't, they're I not agree. exciting. I agree. They're, they're going to the, the Big Ten Championship games. Yes, they're playing the West. They're playing, you know, cruddy competition. And that will change now with the playoffs. And so the expectation of Iowa, I guarantee you, will be making the playoffs. Yeah. If they're not making the playoffs in three years, he's done. Now, he might be done anyway just by his age. I'm not, I can't remember how old he is. He's in his late he's 60s or there. mid 60s, yeah. maybe. But either way, I mean, Iowa football, the patience of Iowa football is different than the basketball program. Clearly, they have more patience of basketball. But. They will not tolerate being sort of just stagnant forever. Uh, and we're now at the point now where they're no longer, there's no reason to look at this team or look at recruits coming in that this is going to take a, you know, going to level up. Right. So, and something changes right. with Fran. And I think that, I think that's, I think that's what's going to happen. I, I just, I just don't see him sticking around. It's funny that you have a team <laughs> where the football team can't score, but has great defense yeah. and the basketball yeah. team can't, can't they can and score they a lot, but they can't defend opposites. anybody. Right. Yeah. 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 And then you have the women's team, which was just, you know, lightning in a bottle with Caitlin, Caitlin Clark. And that, I mean, they've sold out every game. So, I mean, there is, there is, as you pointed out, there is a lot of excitement for Hawkeye sports in that area. There's nothing else to do as you know, that it is Iowa. Everything's Iowa. Iowa state is a very small pocket of the state. So they are the professional team in all respects in the state. So they've all the advantages, right? And so there's, and they can have a great atmosphere there. They just have not put, put it together with their teams uh, on the men's side for a number of years, right? So, I mean, Garza years were good, but I mean, even then uh, th it just has not been the last couple of years. I mean, I watch those games. There's like nobody there and it's, it's a great venue. It's just, it, it's, it's nothing like what is Nebraska. I watch a Nebraska game and people look like they're having fun, even though the team was, was terrible. Right. And that just is not that at Iowa. Yeah. Um, and there's no reason it could be the same there. And I, I mean, I think at some point people are going to, they're not going to tolerate it. They don't want to be, they don't want to be shown up by Nebraska for sure. And actually in some respects, if Nebraska does well in basketball again this year, 
and Iowa has another kind of dwindling season, I think that's further evidence that they're going to make a move too, because, um, you know, that's just not, that's not okay for Iowa. So we'll see. All right. Well, uh, until we get to our next team, the number 13 team, uh, just a quick reminder, of course, check out all our sponsors, go to your support page, find everybody there. So nudge printing, brothers, just you gutters and the squeegee squad, grand rapids, all great sponsors of the show. So until next time, the final four is on the schedule. Go green.